Hello, welcome to Cashcroft TV. My name is Kalen Ashcroft. Thanks for watching another video on our leaders. Today we will be covering Andrzej Duda, the current president of Poland, and Prayut Chanocha, the current prime minister of Thailand. So without further ado, we will begin with Andrzej Duda. So Andrzej Duda is the current president of Poland, and he has held this office since August 6th of 2015. He was formerly a lawyer. He also served as a member of the Polish lower house called the Sejm, which is essentially the Polish parliament. And he held, he was a member of parliament there between 2011 to 2014. And he also served on the European parliament in the European Union representing Poland from 2014 to 2015. So I'll go into more detail on his actual work as a president, but as usual, it's best to start with his early life. So with respect to his early life, he was born on the 16th of May, 1972. So a little bit younger than some of the other heads of state or leaders that we will be covering in this series. Krakow is the second largest city in Poland after Warsaw. It's a very uh, old and beautiful city. In fact, the old town was the first UNESCO World Heritage Site in the world. And formerly, until 1596, Krakow had been the capital of Poland until it was switched to Warsaw, which is the largest city in Poland and is now the capital of Poland. His parents were Janina Miluski and Jan Trudus Duda, both of whom were professors at the AGH University of Science and Technology. So evidently he came from a, um, an academically inclined family and um, was likely partially in some ways inspired by the intellect of his parents. For a little bit of background about the AGH University, it's generally considered to be about fifth in the country after um, most likely number one, the Jagiellonian University, and perhaps tied for number one or maybe number two, the University of Warsaw, and often tied for third spot would be the Adam Mikowitz University and the University of Gansk University of Technology. So generally speaking, AGH is about uh, fifth, so obviously his parents were very intelligent, but also it's even probably higher ranked in the sciences and technologies. His grandfather fought in the Polish-Soviet War and later in the Home Army during the Second World War. So despite his parents not being um, soldiers or having fought in the war, he's not too far removed from the atrocities that had happened to Europe not long before his own lifetime. So just through his heritage, he's uh, obviously, I would believe, and it is true, that he is familiar with the European um, um, uh, sentiment. In, similarly speaking, he went to Jan III Sobieski High School in Krakow, which is considered to be one of the top high schools, not just not only in Krakow, but also in all of Poland. It was founded by King Jan Sobieski III, um, after his victory in the Battle of Vienna in 1883. The, what I mean by his association with war is that this school actually, um, during both world wars, the students fought for the Polish independence during both world wars. As we know, um, during the First and Second World War, Poland was on both occasions invaded. Even more so during the Second World War, when uh, Poland was invaded by Nazi Germany, the Nazis actually used the school for some of their offices. So once again, just through his cultural heritage and through his education, he's very much um, familiar with the, the recent political landscape in Europe. After his high school studies, he furthered on to study law at the Jagiellonian University, which, as I said, is generally considered the best university in Poland. Some might uh, argue that University of Warsaw is better, but um, nonetheless, he went to a very, very top university, and it probably helped that his parents were so academically inclined as well. The school is famous in that Nicholas Copernicus went there. I have a video covering Nicholas Copernicus if you'd like to learn more about him. It's the second oldest surviving university in Central Europe, so very old as well. 
It's founded by Casimir III the Great in 1364, and another alumni was Jan III Sobieski, the founder of his high school, too. So it's also located in Krakow, so he didn't need to go far to continue his studies. Following this, he received a master's in arts in law in October 2001 at 29 years old. So, and at 29 years old, he served as an assistant in administrative law department in Jagiellonian University. So he generally, for the um, most of his young life up until he was 30, spent his whole time in academia in Krakow studying law. In January 2005, he received a PhD in law at the same university as well, Jagiellonian University. At this time, he was 33 years old. And since then, he's actually um, been serving an unpaid leave um, since then for the university as he's been pursuing politics um, starting September, early 2000s. Um, a one brief stint, he returned to the university for about three mo 13 months in 2010 after one of his temporary political defeats um, and before he served in the Polish lower house, before entering parliament. So he has a very strong affiliation with the university and never really moved himself too far away from the academic community and sort of always had it as a, as a sort of fallback. Moving on to his political career, so he began in the now defunct Freedom Union Party in the early 2000s, after, up, approximately after the time he completed his master's and during his early PhD studies. After 2005 elections, he joined the Law and Justice Party, the PIS, which he has remained um, up until this point. The Law and Justice Party, to give it a little bit of perspective of the landscape, is the more right-wing party of Poland. From 2006 to 2007, he served as Under Secretary of State in the Ministry of Justice, which is fitting as he is, has such an impressive legal background, having gone to probably the best university uh, for law in the country and also having a PhD from that same school. From 2007 to 2008, he served as a member of the Polish State Tribunal, which is a, um, a third party that rules on constitutional liability on people holding the highest offices. So it's essentially an oversight group that um, holds the leaders of the country accountable for um, uh, constitutional liability. So I guess the fact that he held this position means that at least the people who put him into that position believe him to be um, uh, somewhat morally non-corrupt and um, also uh, a reliable source for critiquing others in terms of their morality. From 2008 to 2010, he under the presidency of Lech Kaczynski, um, who actually um, was president at this time, died in a plane crash, which the PIS party consider might have been um, uh, an assassination attempt by the opposition and currently let Kaznik's brother, Kaznitsky's brother is the head of the PIS party. So um, uh, uh, some questionable actions, the, it's called the uh, Smolensk plane disaster where it, um, the plane mysteriously crashed over Russia. So um, yes. He served as Under Secretary of State in Chancellery of the President of the Republic of Poland under uh, President Lech Kaczynski. So similar to um, many of the other leaders, he has always had the ability of um, receiving the admiration and mentorship of those with the most power. In 2010, however, as a PIS candidate, he ran for mayor of Krakow and he actually lost. And um, this was actually obviously probably hurt him quite a bit. He returned to the University of Jagiellonski for, um, or the Jagiellonian University for 13 months. However, after this, he ran um, the 2011 parliamentary elections um, to be the um, uh, representative in the lower house, winning 79,981 votes in Krakow election. And he found himself in the 
uh, Sejim. So I guess he he lost a municipal defeat. He did not win the mayorship. However, he won the um, the seat in parliament in the uh, the actual federal government. So a small defeat, but perhaps a bigger win in the long run. So and I, I he kept his head high, which is a very a very impressive thing to do. And like all of these individuals, they all, um, um, which I think is, if, if anything, one of the most important takeaways of this is that, of this whole series, is that all of these leaders have made it to the absolute pinnacle of their own respective nations. However, their careers or lives have not been um, anything but perfect, and they've all had shortcomings. So he lost his mayor, but ended up getting a seat in the Member of Parliament. So... He served in the Sejim from 2011 to 2014, and he also served in the European Parliament from 2014 to 2015, which obviously would have given him respect within the Polish community as one who is uh, globally minded, having served for the European um, Union, the Parliament there, and being a... Um, under, an individual who is well attuned to the political landscape of Europe, the European Union as a whole. He remained in the Sejim until he was ultimately elected um, to the European Parliament, as I mentioned, which did attain him a global perspective. On September of 2013, the news magazine Politica claimed him to be one of the most active in Parliament, he is, was always open to opposition arguments, and he refrained from personal attacks. So he's, um, generally speaking, a, a well-loved person within the parliament and within the press. And I do think this is um, not just um, just tooting his horn. I do think he, he is considered one of the most um, uh, kind and generous people in the parliament, at, at least at the time, and I think still today, hence the reason why he is president. Also during this time he had he served as the role of at the Commission for Constitutional Responsibility. So similarly to how he was before, serving an oversight board um, with respect to um, um, people in the highest offices serving justice, he also served as an oversight board um, looking out for corruption within the parliament during his own time. So always a very trusted individual, likely because of his legal background, but also I think just because of his own um, uh, temperament. And yeah, likely from his Polish state tribunal experience that garnered him that role. So ultimately in terms of presidency, he ran in the 2015 campaign. He in against um, Bronislaw Komorowski, who was also a PIS rival. Um, in the first round, he won 34.76% of the valid votes. And since uh, neither of the two individuals won over 50%, which was necessary to become president, they proceeded to a second round of voting where he came out on top, winning 51.55% of the vote. So pretty close, but nonetheless sufficient enough to garner him the role as president and at the time Bronislav was the uh, Komorowski was the incumbent president so it was obviously he came in as the underdog so but also maybe less so because Bronislav Komorowski actually came into the presidency after the plane crash in Smolensk Rus Russia so there might have been some thoughts that perhaps he might have been part of the conspiracy, but nonetheless, he was not actually formally elected during an election. He was sort of um, uh, found himself in the role after the death of the previous president. The um, in on the twenty sixth of May, therefore, of twenty fifteen, he resigned from the Law and Justice Party, the PIS, the right leaning party right-wing party and uh, attain membership as president re-elect. Going forward on October 24th of 2019, he received official support from the Law and Justice Party, the PIS party, for his 2020 re-election campaign, which will be this year.
In terms of his actual presidency, it's been marked with, um, I guess, one of the most notable events was he rejected the European Union's migrant quotas that they were uh, putting upon the nations of the European Union to redistribute asylum seekers. And here we will get to the first quote. He says, I won't agree to a dictate of the strong. I won't back a Europe where the economic advantage of the size of a population will be the reason to force solutions on the countries regardless of their national interest. So a couple a couple moving parts here. Um, firstly, he's not as favorable as some of the other nations, such as Germany, to the um, the migrants moving into Europe. Uh, later, um, Prime Minister Iwa Kopax um, said that Poland would conform to European solidarity and accept 2,000 migrants over the next two years rather than thir- the 37,000. Uh, 3,700 requested. So they still did concede an offer to take some migrants in order to show European solidarity. But a couple things here. Firstly, he's not as favorable to the idea of migrants moving into Europe. But similarly, he isn't as favorable to the stronger powers of Europe, such as Germany and France, and formerly uh, the United Kingdom. However, they have since left um, forcing the smaller nations such as Poland to um, to uh, to follow in line. So a, a couple um, interesting interesting notes here, and I think that really exemplifies a lot of his general thesis as a uh, president. He has met frequently with President Xi Jinping or Chairman Xi Jinping of the leader of China, the Communist Party of China. He has very he pushes for very strong relations with the Chinese government. He says, um, "Here's the next quote: Pol- Polish companies will benefit hugely from China's Belt and Road Initiative. He hopes to see Poland be China's gateway to Europe, and they have talked much on long-term strategic partnerships between the two countries. Um, this is." Uh, I think indicative of a couple things once again with almost any of these countries the more they move towards perhaps China or Russia is uh, firstly a a move away from the United States hegemony perhaps and similarly it's also I think from Poland's perspective a move away from the reliance on the more powerful powers of the European Union such as once again Germany or France and formerly the United Kingdom. Despite this, some of his more controversial movements, he's received in 2017 a 71% approval rating, and in 2018 even higher, a 72% approval rating, which is has only been surpassed by Alexander Kwasiuszewski, uh, who received over 20, 75% in 1995 to 2005. So uh, what he is doing is generally very well liked amongst the Polish population and um yes he a couple other scandals of his he refused all five of the shajem with selected candidates for the fifth term in the constitutional tribunal so this was considered a bit of a scandal because he shouldn't firstly if parliament shajem suggests individuals to go into this tribunal he's he's not really supposed to veto them but for him to veto it five times it's a little suspicious um firstly maybe he is right he has the strongest legal background and he has spent a lot of time serving on tribunals or maybe it's an act of corruption trying to um trying to keep out individuals who might speak unfavorably of him or try to uh, push for candidates that might speak more favorably of him so nonetheless here it seems like he's at least perhaps might be disputed whether he's trying to um, push himself forward but he's definitely uh, showing some of his power and uh, uh, flexing his muscles a little bit here in 2018 similarly another scandal he refused to sign a holocaust bill or in 2019, he signed a Holocaust bill that made it illegal to accuse the Polish nation of complicity in Holocaust or any other Nazi atrocities. 
which um, in his defense, the, the Polish people, it, it, to, to the extent that they did participate in Nazi atrocities, was forced upon them. However, the United States and the Prime Minister of Israel, Benjamin Netanyahu, have accused him of uh, engaging in Holocaust denial, which is obviously the Holocaust should never be denied. But I think his objective here was to uh, defend the Polish people when I don't think the, the Polish people should uh, necessarily be um, accused or blamed for um, the atrocities of the Holocaust, or at least, um, at least not overly so. In terms of his personal life, uh, I get he married a German language teacher at um, who is who was a, 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 a German teacher language teacher at Jan the Third Sobieski High School in Krakow, the same high school that he went to. He's um, and he met her at a party despite her going to a rivaling school. Her name is Agata Kornhauser Duda. He married her in 1994 at 22 years old, which is quite young for a marriage. Similarly, he has a daughter, uh, Kinga Duda, who is uh, American educated and graduated law in 2019. She's actually very close to my age, so if any of you might happen to know her, I'd, I'd like to meet her. Um, he is, in terms of his personal life, similarly, he's a skier. Uh, he served in the, or performed in the Polish academic championships in the alpine category during his studies. He's also a um, generally a pretty devout Catholic, which is the most common religion in Poland, and he takes part in many of the traditions of Catholicism. He's considered um, one of the, since he comes from a, a more right-wing party, he is stronger force than um, Poland has often seen in history, but might be one that um, is growing more necessary, which goes to a final quote. Everything points to the need to have a substantial pre presence of both infrastructure and military units on the ground in Central European countries, as well as well worked out system for these units and defense should there be any act of aggression. So this is just a quote that emphasizes his belief that Poland needs to become a bit stronger. So he's... Um, he has a, I think, a good understanding of the events that took place in the 20th century, and I think he does um, hope that um, similar events do not unfold where Poland is sort of gets the short end of the stick. So I think he's advocating for a stronger um, governance and a stronger military presence for Poland. Similarly, he fears countries such as. Um, the more powerful countries of the European Union are exerting too much pressure on Poland, and therefore he sees it necessary that Poland become uh, stronger. To the symbols on the, on the page, here we have the symbol of the president of, of Poland. Here is the symbol of the Sejm, which is the parliament of Poland. Here's the symbol of his school, Jan III, and here's the symbol of the Jabalonian University, where he studied law and uh, received his PhD as well as his master's. So in terms of the country itself, the population is 37.97 million, um, actually quite close to the population of Canada, where I am from. However, the GDP is quite, um, uh, uh, well, on a global scale, pretty high, per the population, but some other countries are a bit higher per the population at 524.5 billion. The area is 312,679 kilometers squared. So um, not overly large, but once again, larger than others. Um, in fact, I have an Excel spreadsheet where I have listed um, all of the, the, the leaders that I will be covering. And these two leaders actually find themselves exactly in the middle of the pack in terms of the leaders. So very much a, um, a middle middle of the pack in terms of GDP, which is also a good indicator of uh, political strength. So moving on to uh, uh, Chanocha of Thailand, and then we'll speak more of uh, Duda in the comparison. 
So Prayut Chanocha was born on March 21st, 1954, so quite a bit older than Anze Duda. He's a retired Royal Thai General Officer. He was former, formerly the leader of the National Council for Peace and Order, the NCPO, which um, was a, a time during his military junta that ruled Thailand between the 22nd of May to tw of 2014 to the 10th of July of um, 2019. As of August 2019, he has served as Prime Minister of Thailand, as well as Defense Minister and Head of the Royal Thai Police. Um, so it sounds as though he only just became Prime Minister. However, during his time as leader of the NCPO, in all intensive purposes, he ruled the country as soon as he claimed military control during the coup in 2014. So he's... It, I think it's safe to say that he has held power since 2014. Similar time as Anze Duda, who came to power in 2015. In addition to his role as Prime Minister and Defense Minister and Head of Royal Thai Police, he also assumed the duties of the Deputy Prime Minister as Head of the Economic Team, and he also oversees the Justice Ministry's Department of Special Investigation, the DSI. So he has essentially sweeping powers all across Thailand. For a little bit of perspective on this, just before jumping into his early life and then elaborating more on his time as actual president, um, I remember I went to Thailand quite a bit um, well before he uh, claimed military control of the country. I remember I had a discussion with an individual how, um, how, how much relative power the king actually had. And um, it's amazing how much times have changed in that I was uh, going to cover the king. But now it, I think it's safe to say that the king, who uh, was one of the oldest kings to come to the throne at 64, he's now quite a bit older than that. Now it's safe to say uh, Vajira Longkorn is... Um, uh, does not hold nearly as much power as Prayut Chanocha. Uh, I guess a little bit more background on the king. I think it's safe to cover him just because it's important to note. He is the son of King Bu Minal Adulaydaj and Queen Sikarit, um, and he is their only son. Well, what was their only son because his parents are no longer alive. At age 20, his father declared him Crown Prince of Thailand, which essentially meant he would become president. He's famous. He was famous as a playboy, and he has four wives. His father died on October 13 of 2016, and he mourned his father until October 1st of 2016, where he when he accepted the throne. He had a coronation on the uh, between the 4th and 6th of May 2019. And however, the government retroactively declared him king since his death. But his period as king, um, despite him technically speaking have, having much power, I think can be safely say marked with um, uh, uh, Prayut Chanocha having almost complete control over the country through his control over the military. The king has a supposed net worth of 30 billion. He's called Rama the 10th because he's the 10th monarch of the Char Chakri dynasty. And as mentioned, he's the six at 64. He's the oldest to send to the throne. So he's about two years older than Prayut Chanocha. So going back to Chano uh, Prayut Chanocha, the, um, the, uh, the effectual leader of Thailand as of now. In terms of his early life, he studied at the Armed Forces Academics Preparatory School, the AFAPS, Class 12, the Command and General Staff College, CGSC, Class 63, the National Defense College of Thailand, NDC, 5020, and Infantry Officer Basic Course, Class 51, and the Infantry Officer Advanced Course, Class 38. So pretty much a purely military background. He is a, uh, a soldier and general through and thin, um, thick and through. Pardon me. Um, he was born, as mentioned, on March 21st, 1954, so he's currently 66 years old. In He was born in the Nakhon Rachisma 
province, which is a little bit of background about Thailand. Thailand is divided into 76 provinces, which is a, quite a, a lot of provinces. The United States has 50 states, Canada has 13 provinces. However, Thailand does have a pretty big population, but I think um, 76 states is a lot um, to divide the country amongst. And his province, Nakhon Rachisma, is um, home to 2.7 million people. However, it is the largest by area. He received a Bachelor of Science degree from the Chulachomkala Kla uh, Royal Military Academy, which is the top military academy in Thailand, and many top many prime ministers as well as generals all went to this academy, including his predecessor, um, Anupong Pauchinda, um, who and who was also former defense minister as well. He comes from, he served in the 21st Regiment, so he's referred to as one of the Eastern Tigers faction of the army, which similarly his predecessor, Anupong Pauchinda, also came from. So the Eastern Tigers is um, uh, a name associated with this group, group of individuals who started their military careers um, off in the East, um, as well as... Uh, in the Second Infantry Division, which has their headquarters in the Eastern Thailand, particularly within the Second Infantry Division, the 21st Infantry Regiment, also known as the Queen's Guard, um, is pretty much the best place to go to rise in the, the military ladder. And that's exactly what Prayut Chanocha did. He So, after graduating from his Bachelor's of Science degree from the Chaluchonkla Military Academy. He ser he began at the Twenty First Regiment, and which is, as mentioned, the the best place politically speaking to rise in the ranks. In two thousand and two, he came to Deputy Commanding General of the Second Infantry Division at forty eight years old. So he stayed really with this uh, the military for a very very long time before actually getting a, a position of substantial power. So he really, um, he showed a lot of grit, I guess, in sticking with the army and not going into um, leaving. But on the other hand, maybe it would have been difficult for him as well to leave. But nonetheless, he showed a lot of commitment to the military. In 2003, he became commanding general at 49 years old. And a, year, uh, a couple years later, at 51 years old, he became, in 2005, Deputy Commanding General of the 1st Army, which includes the 2nd Infantry Division that he was formerly the head of. From 2008 to 2009, he became Chief of Staff to the Royal Thai Army at 54 years old, and also Honorary Adjutant to the King, so the father of Vajrikalon Kor, the king, father of the king, the previous king, he was his personal adjutant. And in 2010, he succeeded Anupong Pauchinda as commander-in-chief of the Royal Army. So, essentially, he just climbed through the ranks slowly but surely by um, affiliating himself by, with the right people, but also finding himself in the right regiments and right sects of the army in order to uh, best facilitate his climb. As he was commander chief of the Royal Army in October of 2010, um, he was considered a royalist and an opponent of the former prime minister. So he aligned himself with the former king, which was important because he was the king's adjutant. And this was a time, as I spoke when I went to Thailand formally, and the king was particularly powerful. So I guess it was in his best interest to align him. He's considered, he was considered a hardliner, especially in his military crackdown on the red shirt demonstration in 2009 to 2010, where there were um, protesters against the, the coup, the military coup that took place at that time. However, he later apologized to many of the individuals' families who had died in the bloody, um, the bloody event. During Ying Luck's the um, who was head of the caretaker government in November 2013. There were um, many protesters against the caretaker government 
However, he said the army would remain neutral and there would be no coup. However, in 2014 of May, the military coup, he engaged in a military coup against the government and assumed control as NCPO leader. And he, during this time, he created an interim constitution, which gave him sweeping powers and even gave him amnesty for his action of seizing control of the government. In August of 2014, the unelected military-dominated national legislature appointed him also essentially prime minister. So as of, as of this time, 2014, although undemocratically, he became the leader of Thailand. Despite, um, obviously, the, uh, the king didn't do anything at this time. The king was, um, was mourning. Well, uh, the, the, the actual king died a couple years later in 2016. And uh, Prayut Chanocha had given him loyalty. He was formerly his adjutant. So he, I guess, did not want to step in and prevent him from gaining this control. During his period... While he was head of this um, military elected government, he had a crackdown on dissent. He created the the 12 values, which instilled traditional Thai values in schools. So he's actually um, quite a quite a, a, a good Buddhist one could consider he's a pretty religious individual. He also engaged, however, in measures limiting public discussions about democracy, as well as government criticism. Um, criticism against his government and also engaged in some internet and media censorship. In 2019, he was elected prime minister in the Thai general election. To what extent might we consider it democratic is obviously up to dispute, but nonetheless, he is prime minister of Thailand. In terms of his personal life, he has also, outside of this, served on many executive boards of many companies, including, for example, the Metropolitan Electricity Authority, the MEA, which is a very powerful uh, authority as they have control over the electricity. In 2007 to 2010, he was an independent director of the Thai Oil Public Co. Uh, independent director, giving him, once again, sweeping powers, which is very characteristic of, of uh, everything he did, having... Uh, climb to the top of the military ladder. He, in, since 2010, he has served as director of the Thai Military Bank and chairman of the Army United Football Club. So he has, he promotes the sports and athletics, but always um, uh, um, uh, an association and support for the military and all of their endeavors. In 2013, it said he sold 69 properties for 600 million baht, which is the equivalent of $20 billion. He said, what is the problem? He inherited them from his family, but that is a, a lot of pro properties, and whether or not he got all the money from it, a lot of money to be dealing with. In 2014, a year later, the National Corruption Agency of Thailand claimed he had 128.6 million baht at a, only 3.9 million, so much, quite far away from the 20 billion dollars in assets he was controlling, and only 20,000 US dollars in liabilities. So, um, I do not believe these figures are correct. I believe he has a lot more assets and a lot more wealth. And I think that, to, firstly, I think the National Corruption Agency, which calculated this, was corrupt in themselves. And probably um, uh, he suggested at these values. But even then, maybe maybe it is right. He is, he is absolute, pretty much absolute control over the military and absolute control of the government. He could seize any wealth that he wants. So I, I think his, his actual net worth would be something close to the to um, at least a good fraction of the GDP of all of Thailand because in effect he could pretty much seize almost whatever he wants. In terms of some of his assets to mention, he has a Mercedes-Benz S600L, a BMW 740Li series, sedan plus three other vehicles. He has nine luxury watches valued at 3 million baht, which is um, uh, almost the entire net worth that he was um, that the the corruption agency claimed that he had um, or equal to about the value of his just his watches alone. He has 
a 200,000 US dollar jewelry correct collection, as well as several pistols as um, indicative of his military background. He claimed a $14.3 million transfer to some of his family members, which is, as mentioned before, over four times his actual calculated net worth. So obviously the figure that was given by the, the National Corruption Agency was, I would say, false. But um, I think he, he um, in effect, uh, he, he has claim to whatever wealth he wishes. He's also a, a, a acclaimed songwriter. He has a very famous song, Return to Happiness in Thailand, which is one of his famous mottos as well. He speaks on many talk shows talking about the return to happiness in Thailand. And he his um, supporters call him Big Two or Uncle Two, um, affectionately. He's married to Nara Porn Changocha, who is a, was a former language professor Interestingly enough, as well, uh, as a um, Duda, on a Duda, his um, wife is also a language, language teacher, so just a first parallel there. His, he has twin daughters, um, Pu, uh, Punik, um, uh, sorry, Nita and Tanya, and they actually had a punk band called Bads. And apparently he also consults a fortune teller often, and he says there's no harm in seeking advice, which I think is actually a, a good, I think uh, a lot of people get um, recently criticized for perhaps their, uh, their, their religion or their superstition, superstitions, but I don't think there's, there's too much wrong with superstition as long as it doesn't, um, doesn't uh, uh, lead to detrimental effects. So to move into the quotes, if people want to do opinion polls, they are free to do so. But if the polls oppose the NCPO, that is not allowed. So um, just kind of indicative of his a little bit of anti-democratic uh, um, beliefs, but also a little bit of his uh, censorship um, uh, predisposition. We'll probably execute the journalists, he says jokingly. Um, however, some journalists supposedly might have been caused by some of the um, uh, members of his military. You don't have to support the government, but you should report the truth. Um, the people who do wrong in human trafficking must repent. They have done this for a long time, for many years, and past administrations were never able to cope. So, uh, as you know, Thailand does have a quite a, um, a problem with human trafficking. So, uh, supposedly, it's actually well associated with the fishing industry. So this is something that he does not support and does want to crack down on, and maybe his... Um, uh, strength might actually help facilitate easing this off. You do not learn to respect law in instead of claiming, uh, you do not learn to respect the law instead of claiming democracy and human rights. So essentially what he means here is that um, the, the, uh, following the law is more important than um, uh, merely fighting for democracy and human rights. Once again, a lot of these statements are, are, are quite vulgar. However, many people in Thailand, it should not be forgotten that many people in Thailand do support this individual. And despite a lot of the um, negativity that is directed to him through um, international organizations, he is um, a good portion of the people in Thailand do support him. And, um, at least he has gone back to a somewhat democratic government. It's perhaps uh, maybe his government, although it's backed by the military. Is it better than a monarchical government? Perhaps. So um, all of these things, maybe it is moving in a better direction. And as I said, the main, main one of the main theses of this um, of this series is that I'm going to trying to put all of these individuals in the best light possible. Um, I assume many of you might. Uh, have a much more positive or m many even more might have a more negative perspective of this individual but uh, nonetheless he um, he definitely is a hard-working individual and he, he you know he stayed with the military until almost his um, well even into his 60s and he uh, shows a lot of grit in terms of his um, um, effort so moving to the symbols and then to the country um, information and then we'll speak on to the comparison so here is the seal of the prime minister of thailand here is the symbol of his university called the 
uh, Chula Chomkla Royal Military Academy, which is um, where many other prime ministers of Thailand had gone and probably the, the top place to go if one hopes to rise in not only power in the military, but in effect in power in terms of Thailand. Here's the symbol of the 21st Infantry Regiment, which is also a representative of the Eastern Tigers, um, which he and his predecessor were a part of. And lastly, here's the symbol of the Royal Thai Army, which he was the head of. As for uh, the country information, 69.04 million, which is um, not uh, quite substantially, almost double that of, of Poland. However, the GDP is even um, for, at 455.2 billion, um, almost 100 billion less than Poland. Nonetheless, they are um, they are quite close in terms of GDP. The area is 513,120 km kilometers. So um, to, to package this up, the population is quite a bit bigger. The Geographically, it is quite a bit bigger. However, the GDP is a bit smaller. So um, that is not necessarily just the result of the own country's efforts, but also just the result of the the economic environment that it is surrounded in as well also plays an effect on this. Oh, and here is also, as you might expect, this is the flag of Thailand, and I didn't mention this is the flag of Poland. So as for the comparison between these two individuals, you might think they're very, very different at first, but I think the most obvious one uh, comparison would be um, besides small things like both of their... Um, their wives are um, language teachers. The, the most important one for me is that both of these two individuals cl climbed the, 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 to the, the pinnacle of political power through generally really conservative routes. Um, Alonze Duda was, uh, went to the top law school, did a master's in law, PhD in law, he went to, um, he even tried going from municipal government prior to going into federal government. However, he ended up going straight into federal government. Nonetheless, he took a very, very conservative path to finding himself as president of Poland. Similarly, with uh, Pryat, uh, Pryut Chanocha, he took a very, very conservative path, as many other of the past prime ministers and other past leaders of the military had done. He went to the most important military school. He joined the 21st Regiment, the Eastern Tigers, which was probably the most um, uh, powerful regiment of the army. So they, I think they both took very, very conservative paths. In addition, I think both of them are um, at least stronger than their contemporaries within their own countries, um, uh, um, relatively speaking. Anze Duda is, um, although not quite a, a military um, one to engage in a military coup, unlike past um, Polish leaders, he does take a much stronger and tougher stance uh, with respect to its relations with the European Union. He advocates for strengthening the military of Poland and seeking allies, um, uh, uh, alternative allies, such as with uh, Xi Jinping, as well as with Chanocha. He obviously comes from a military background. He Although coups were not necessarily uncommon, both within his own time in Thailand and even throughout history, he was one who really uh, brought the coup to the next level and fully took control of the government for a substantial period of time. So, yeah, that is the life of Anze Duda and Prayut Chanocha. I hope you enjoy this video and I hope you uh, continue to support and watch. Thank you so much.